The Proleptic Journal of a Shite Extractor Tractor Man by Scott Waller 9. One day later I didn't finish speak writing about my adventures. I told the essential. We met, we embraced, and we consummated our love. I think I can call it love. Not that I told her. I didn't want to sound silly. What does the word love mean anyway? Is it not just a cliché? The fantasy of some sentimental neurodrama? I used to think so. But now I'm far from sure. I've never felt anything like this before. I was imbued with a strange kind of distilled tenderness mixed with jittery, awed nerves. There was an easy mutual understanding that the moment was to be as perfect as possible. Without planning or requests, or much in the way of words, just exploring and enjoying one another's presence. It wasn't just the passionate intensity of the lovemaking, it was the peaceful intensity of lying together naked, side by side. Often I couldn't stop myself from caressing her, and even tickling her, particularly since, by accident, I discovered the spot that released her girly giggle. It was the loveliest sound to have ever filled my ears. Somehow I believe that, somewhere deep within, I had already sensed something of this when I first heard her laugh in the corridor. Perhaps there was something already contained in that initial laughter which had me glimpse the outline of a wonderful future possibility and which led me towards its fulfilment without me really knowing what was going on. There was more to our precious time together than tactile joys. We bonded in naked spirit in these moments that our bodies lay clothesless together. We talked to each other softly and freely, sharing vulnerable, intimate thoughts and memories, opening to each other and mingling in our openness. It's funny, I don't feel entirely comfortable talking about my intimate experiences with Faye. I'm not ashamed, it's just that it wouldn't be appropriate to share with other people the precious moments that belong to the two of us and the two of us alone. To be more exact, there were many elements involved in this us. There was a new me that I hadn't known before, emerging from the old me, there with her, and there was the her with me, that was there with the place and moment. Does that make any sense? Maybe I won't understand what I'm talking about in months from now. I won't know, of course, because I won't get to read it. It's probably better that way. Rare and prized events like that are irretrievable. You can't bring back the moods, the smell, the expectation and the unexpected all cascading its own rich and subtle combination onto the instant. Sometimes I get involuntary memories of childhood, of rare moments of intense joy or pain. In child-rearing institutions, so much is done to eliminate the latter, that the occasions for the former become collateral damage in the smoothing out of risk. Perhaps you can only get the essence of those events, because they grab you when you aren't expecting it. I don't know. Hopefully in the future, something will trigger the precious moments spent with Faye back to me. I'm almost getting maudlin. I sound as if Faye and I are about to say farewell. When precisely opposite is the case, far from talk about not seeing each other, she let me into her social circle. And, if I'm to be true to my first impressions, what a circle of odd balls she has for friends. There was a whole array of unique individuals. There was Abe, bearing his stringy white beard held together with several beads. This bobble cord wagged below his chin as he moved his head and spoke of the wonder of the natural world and all the different kinds of plants he was nurturing in the grounds and in the greenhouse tent. His companion, Itzel, was short, squat, bursting with life and able to recite reams of poetry, as A boasted proudly on her behalf. I heard some of this extempore verse. She was very good and very funny. She, like quite a few people in this crowd, wore external visual aids called glasses or spectacles, like they used to wear in the old days. There was Werner, who flicked his fingers frantically, as though he were playing an invisible keyboard. He didn't look other people in the eye. He obviously had some condition that had escaped the normal correction processes. At first I thought this oversight was due to some sort of malfunction in the child-rearing institution, 
but Fay later told me that his parents did not want their son's particularities to be wiped away. That did surprise me. There was Niall with his long, scraggly, black and white strands, sticking out in all directions. He seemed to know so much. He had a theory about everything. His words threw a fresh light on so much that I might have taken as already understood. Just simple things, like the names given to things, reveal a lot. For example, he told me that the guardian protectors in a strapping pot were originally called the dormitivity guardians when they were first invented, because they had the function of keeping the mind dormant and incapable of taking initiative. Niall calls them the guardians of sleep. Other things that I had taken to be simple turn out to be complex. He explained how the lower stratum was the engine of society, how the middle stratum was the indentured clerical servant running everything, while the upper stratum was essentially a computer program dependent parasitic class giving executive orders. This did not make much sense to me, but he explained it with such conviction that I found him captivating. There was Istoire Geo, who was always smiling with her teeth that had gaps in them. This was disconcerting, because it cost nothing to get artificial teeth. But that was their way. If nature wants to take a tooth, nature is entitled to it. Histoire Geo had a habit of getting up in the middle of a conversation, wandering about and asking people, Where am I? Where is such and such a place? She had problems getting a grip on the spatial world. She also had a faulty temporary memory, often forgetting precisely when things had happened in the past. But apart from that, everything else was working fine in her brain. Everybody seemed to accept her confusion without getting impatient. They were always helpful to her when required. Istoiseo was also extremely wrinkled for her age, about 70. But she, like the rest of them, refused elementary skin correction. I briefly spoke to Kanye, who was in charge of animal husbandry. He loved animals and carted many of them about to other little oases. There was Madge with her broad smile, her loud sniffing and her handshake that grips like someone who has just got her mitts on the handle of the pot at the end of the rainbow. The truth is that if anyone had discovered their rainbow pot, it was me. My eyes were opened. Only days ago, I would have considered people like this to be suspect or deviant, that their vision of nature, society and the world was outdated. I would have poured scorn on their lifestyles and taken their dissidents for dangerous delusion. I would have thought that they had no self-respect or that they were irresponsible for not keeping up standards of personal aesthetic requirements. If an eligible had announced that they were going to round them up and give them the forced correction treatment they required, I would have seen that as a perfectly normal thing to do. But now I have a peculiar admiration for them. They are not beautiful in the conventional sense, but their untampered, uncosmetized, unsurgically modified faces dance in my mind like the notes of a stirring, meandering melody. They shunned recognizable models of beauty and kept their individuality. I realized how special the face is, how faces sear deeply into the mind of the perceiver. Each face is like a piece of music, this one serene and harmonious, that one frightening, another with an alluring combination of discord and harmony, this one arresting in its mystery, that one sweet at first, but going astray later, or the other way round, this one badly tuned, that one seems to clench even the furthest reach of consciousness on first impact. The music of an individual face is easily identifiable, but it brings to mind associations with other faces we have encountered. We cannot stop ourselves from liking or disliking a face because of these associations. We succumb easily to the temptation of reading an individual personality and history through a face. It's as though the face were like those bones which fate told me about, that the ancient Chinese believed contained the mysteries of destiny revealed in the obscure ideograms they scribbled all over them. Hieroglyphics that grew associative branches bearing, like fruit, the manifold images and sounds floating in individual and collective memory. The protrusion of the bridge of a nose, the width between eyes, the size of a mouth, a chin askew, 
the arch of eyebrows, the slightest detail in an eye, the gaps or wonks in unperfected teeth. All these we take for the deepest indications of the soul. So much so, that when we think of someone's personality, I wonder whether we are in part thinking of the particular music of their face. A stare, a blink, a frown, a smile, with its wryness, warmth, cynicism, spontaneity, sorrow, harshness, love, or what have you. A quick flick of the eye upwards or downwards. These are revelations equivalent to the oracle reader's answering to his questioning the bone, which, under the pressure of the heat that the ancient shaman or priest applied to it, opens wrinkle-like cracks in the direction of one cliff as opposed to another, thus uncovering the esoteric secrets of the universe. This was just one among many attempts of humans to wrench the furtive, numinous phrase from the dumb world of things. We live in an ocean of faces that surround us, that inhabit us, that speak to us in dialects we barely grasp. Among Fay's friends, I was beginning to realise that I also had oceans within that I have never even noticed before. These distants live in a very basic little hippieish hideout. They produce much of their own food. Perhaps what was most difficult for me to get my head round was that they live without modern conveniences such as strapping seats, neuro game equipment and other devices. I had to get used to peeing against trees or in the bushes as they did. There didn't even seem to be an easily accessible excretion extraction point. When I mentioned this, Abe reassured me that they had the means for anyone to cope. Mentioning something about teas or roots which worked wonders. I wasn't entirely put at ease by all that. And yet I think that if they'd said that I had to jump into a vat of boiling tea in order to keep company with Faye, I would have taken the plunge. My determination was soon to be put to the test. We were all sitting around in a circle on the ground by an outdoor fire when things started to get odd. There was a moment when the conversation went dry and Abe casually lifted up one of his cross legs and allowed a noisy rasping sound to escape from his body. As I explained above, I and everyone I've known are equipped with digestive modulators in our personal waste evacuators, so you simply don't hear these noises, even from your own body. We regard that noise with disgust. Perhaps similar to the kind of disgust that people in your day might feel when seeing someone emptying their pants in public. But far from being ashamed at this little gaseous outburst, Abe seemed to beam with pride. Even more disturbing to me was the fact that his performance elicited a spate of solemn murmurings of approval from those around him. Everyone must have noticed the blood draining from my cheeks, for I became the centre of attention. Fay proceeded to explain to me the whys and wherefores of all this. It turns out that among many of these back-to-nature types, farting has become an act of ritual subversion. It was for that reason that it was entirely normal for Abe's public performance to be greeted as though it were oratorical eloquence. In our contemporary world, put in Madge with mock pomp, the fart has become a rebellious cry in the wilderness. With that I began to laugh. All of us did. I hadn't laughed like that for ages. It began to hurt my stomach, but it didn't matter because I was having so much fun laughing. I heard Faye's little giggle again. I can still hear it now, which not only reassured me, it added her seal of magic to the moment. As we all caught the contagion of one another's laughter, Faye's laughter became more hearty and womanly. Hearing it made me fall even more deeply in love with her. The thought occurred to me, I never want to be deprived of hearing that laugh. Then, all of a sudden, I was wrenched from the mood of collective hilarity by something else in me. Pain. For what had started as the spasmodic soreness coming from my laughing, now became a prolonged agony in my stomach. It was my lower intestines telling me what my PWE had been trying to tell me earlier, with all its annoying beeping, which indicates emptying time. So often that I ended up turning the thing off. Then I was distracted, so I forgot to switch it back on. As soon as I realised this, I told Faye, 
and everyone else who happened to be in earshot, more's the pity, what my problem was, and that I needed to hook up to an excretion evacuation point. She looked at me with a mien in which compassion was having it out with a desire to burst out laughing again. The former was definitely losing the battle. Worse, she was sharing knowing smiles with Kanye and Itzel. I was slightly put out by this, but things got worse. For, as diplomatically as possible, she broke it to me that there was not a single EEP in the whole of the community, and that everyone had reverted to evacuating their natural waste. Well, naturally. My dismay at this news mounted all the more with the pain in my lower intestines that was building up and beginning to hurt like hell. I don't know what kind of state I looked like I was in, with my face in the throes of a panic attack and my arms hugging my stomach, but Itzel sympathetically informed me that Abe was making a herbal remedy. Before long, I saw the tall and lanky figure of Abe swaying towards me with a large steaming cup in his hand. He handed it to me. Get that inside you. It'll soon sort you out. There was something affectionate in his voice that reassured me and prepared the groundwork for the cure of the herbal drink before it had even passed my lips. Drink it warm, advised Faye. It tasted bitter, but rich, somehow reminiscent of an early morning walk in the forest. I began to feel better. I supposed that this wasn't the first time that they'd brought someone out of the EE network. They doubtlessly had to come out of that system themselves at one point. So I reasoned that I didn't need to worry too much. I drank up. Faye then gave me a somewhat solemn look. When it takes effect, you will need to go to the closet fairly quickly. To the what? I asked. No sooner had I uttered these words than I felt a rumbling within that erupted in a gaseous release from my rear end, which stunned me, but earned me the same tokens of approval that Abe's noise had received. My inner PWE was giving way under the pressure. It felt like I was going to explode. I was horrified. It was all happening too fast. Am I... I just managed to articulate rather pathetically. Am I becoming a hippie too? Come with me, said Faye, standing up and holding out a hand to help me to my feet. We trotted towards the closet. You may as well switch off your PWE thingy completely now. You won't need it here. With that, I reached to the button just below the skin of the right lower belly and switched it off completely, filled with trepidation. That was not the only thing I was filled with. I removed the rear component of the PWE and sat down ready to let my body release its waste. Do you mind if I close the door, Fay? Door? said Fay. I don't know if there is one. We don't bother about that any more. Oh yes, there's a little one behind the seat. It has no hinges, but you can lean it against the entrance if you like. I won't hold it against you if you're not a bona fide hippie yet. So down I sat and did my business. I can't say I enjoyed this part of my crash course in hippiehood, but I suppose I did have a vague sense of achieving something. I was certainly glad when it was over. Later Niall explained that shitting, as he called it, using the old-fashioned term which comes across as a little pretentious today, was a propitious moment for contemplation or reading a good book. On the shit seat, you feel a special kind of concentration, for while the body is evacuating that for which it no longer has need of, the mind gains a disposition to ingest intellectual food at an increased rate. Niall expanded much on this theory, after which others compared their own preferred activities on the same seat. I listened, still a little under the weather, much bemused, a little shocked, not entirely convinced, but straining to keep an open mind so that my small step in the large quest for insertion into Faye's world would not be in vain. But right now, revealing that world to you has made me speak right myself to exhaustion. I'll have to take my reminiscences about that world to bed with me, and, with any luck, tell you more about it tomorrow. Two days later. I was tired after a long day at work yesterday, and I'm still a little tired this evening, but I want to speak right all the same. I can't stop thinking about the weekend when I'll be seeing Faye again. I can't quite make sense of her. 
Obviously, there is the stratum difference to deal with. I have rubbed shoulders with many a middle stratum, but I have never been on intimate terms with one. Then again, I have never been on intimate terms like that with anyone. In some ways, Faye has fallen from grace and lost her natural place in the conventional life of the middle stratum. She and all her friends, most of them on middle stratum too, are what I used to call outcasts. They don't use that word, which they see as an insult. They prefer the term dissidence. She said that when she first dropped out of the system, she felt like a failure. Her parents stopped taking an interest in her because they viewed her as their failure, and that only reinforced her negative feelings. But then she realised that it was precisely because her parents thought that she was a failure that she felt like one in the first place. Not just her parents, but all her entourage, her school companions, all the typical information you get over the slip net, all the conventional neurodramas and the like. Everything was telling her that to become an outcast meant becoming a loser. But she came to realise that she was who she was and did not want to change for anyone. She was lucky enough to meet a couple of other people who thought like this. They introduced her to the life of dissidence. It was then that she felt that she belonged somewhere for the first time in her life. But the strength of dominant social ideas is such that it takes you years to shake them off. Other failures of the middle stratum with whom she was now socialising seemed perfectly reconciled with their new status as outcasts. They were renegades from the strata system, consciously rejecting its core values and all the basic assumptions that kept it intact and encouraged people to conform to it. She grew to feel comfortable in this new social world and gladly turned her back on the old one. Now, as a dissident, she feels that this new life of hers is how things were always meant to be. Niall knows more about these things than I ever will, she acknowledged to me. But it's obvious that everything works for the benefit of the Darvosians. Middle strata work like dogs with their heads, and for that privilege they escape being demoted to lower stratum status. The same lower strata that they hold in contempt deep down, whatever show of politeness they might make, the lower strata give the best of their bodily energy to the system, which sucks it out along with a bit of neuronal contribution for advert researchers, while their mind-body continuums go to rot, stagnating in strapping pots. What do upper strata do? Whatever they like. They can rule over us if that tickles their fancy. Or they can live like sultans and get away with murder. That is literally true, by the way. We dissidents know about some of the sordid, horrible things they get up to. They can kill and enslave whoever they want from the Rediplaces or the lower stratum. They sometimes even kidnap pretty girls from the middle stratum for their amusement. They have the means to cover up their crimes. We don't know the half of it. This was a rather sobering vision of things and I was almost floored by what she said about lower strata. After all, what did that make me? What did she think of me? But I didn't say anything at the time, as I could see that she didn't mean to hurt me. She doubtlessly feels a little sorry for me. Well, I reasoned, if that helps her to like me, at least I get what I want. But ever since that conversation, the thought has been nagging me. What if she pities me? and is incapable of loving me. Could she ever truly love someone like me? Then it occurred to me that one emotion does not cancel out another. Pity need not exclude love. Perhaps love can take the form of pity as a starting point and then develop into love based on some form of admiration. But how can I win her admiration? She admires people that are so different from me. I suppose it is up to me to change. Apart from that, all my thoughts about fate are positive, and I'm counting down the minutes to our next meeting. Two weeks later. I haven't speak written about my life much of late, because I've spent all my free energy living it to the full. My new life is lavished with fresh light and warmth from a new son called Faye. I saw her again at the weekend, and the world was wonderful. The two of us went walking in a natural spot, smaller than the little green oasis, but far from urban life. There was no dissident residential camp there, 
Local authorities don't allow it, but she and her group occasionally frequented the spot for the day. Like the oasis, it is modest in its natural beauty, compared to the more exotic nature reconstructions I'm used to. But once again, she gave me a taste for its authenticity. After doing more walking than I had ever done in so short a space of time in my slobby life, we arrived at a little row of hills that Itza once called, in an extempore poem, the Braille of the Gods, and the name has stuck ever since. Faye told me that Itzel had spoken about the hands of the gods passing over the skin of the earth and reading the language of the mysteries that are harmonious forms to us. On one of those hills, I felt a godlike touch, the divine fingers of love. We held hands and walked around in the open air. It tasted pure, its pureness wove in and out of me with every breath. Later we met up with dissidents. I didn't know any of them apart from Abe. They were gathering at the mouth of a cave that had some basic fittings in it. When Faye saw them, her eyes widened. Now you have to witness this. What are they doing? They're going to begin a flatual factive seance. A what a factive? You'll see, or rather you'll smell. It's all about appreciation of the body's internal generative power and richness and the development of the capacity of subtle, olfactive, that means smelling, apparatus. Oh? The guy who was apparently presiding over the event was called Jean-Claude. He called upon a certain lady among them to begin the proceedings as follows. OK, Teresa, let's see what you've got. Teresa widened her knees somewhat, twisted to the side, made an awkward lopsided facial expression, which began progressively to ease up, as a lengthy, not very harmonic, groan was released from our lower region. Once this sound was over, she stood up straight and smiled. Sounds full and promising, commented Jean-Claude. The whole group began to lean forward in the direction of Teresa, flare their nostrils, and take long breaths through the nose. Somewhat floral, sweet, and quince. Positively prunish, put in a gentleman with a messy mop of yellow hair. More like pear to me, added a jovial chap with a slightly pug face, and many others present seemed to agree. A definite tang of walnut. Put in a bespectacled man with a small chin, and further murmuring ensued as Jean-Claude took notes with a pen he pulled out from a paper notebook. All right, Michel, give us your best, admonished Jean-Claude once he had finished scribbling. Michel, a tall, slightly haughty-looking man, made a gesture not dissimilar to Teresa and released a trump that resembled a squeal. Once he had finished, he stood up straight and smiled proudly, adding, I have a feeling that this one is going to be good. The rest of the group began attentively sniffing Michael's product in exactly the way they had sniffed Teresa's. Oh, yes, piped Jean-Claude. Twist of honey, I'd say, albeit a tad underdeveloped. Somewhat smoky said Teresa. No, burned, I'd say, amended the jovial pug-faced one. But a little easily all the same, added Abe. Woody, with a lot of wit, pulse, no doubt. Did you perchance partake of lentils? asked the bespectacled man, apparently called Michael. Jean-Claude finished noting and invited the podgy, scruffy, yellow-haired man to contribute. He proceeded to squat quite low and release an ostentatious trump. Mmm, hummed Jean-Claude, substantial, if a little pompous. Behold the grand aerial woof of a fleet from the golden spicy wharf. Not that spicy, not Maggie, I believe, said Michel. Surely a hint of tame, said Michael. Uh, composty, I'd say, with a dab of pepper, suggested ponderously a thin man with round metal-rimmed glasses, known as Jacob. A little leathery, said Teresa, or peaty. I would go as far as to call it turdy, said Jean-Claude, with his eye focused on the notes he was jotting. Then it was Jacob's turn. His corporeal production made a sustained high-pitched note that did not vary in tone. Cumin-like, approved Abe. 
distinct mushroom, said the yellow-haired man, a little contemptuously, perhaps even enviously. Herbaceous and noble, but somewhat gammy, opined another voice I could not identify. Gradual diffusion, said Michael. Hmm, harsh and sweaty, marine, said Jean-Claude. It is becoming distinctly fishy, put in Michel. It was the pug-faced man's turn. His technique involved cocking his right leg. Oh, generous as always, Nigel, said Jean-Claude. Generous is an understatement, said Abe. Did I always slip into your soup? A definite sudden eater, suggested Michel. Somewhat addled. Eggy and pungently so, said Angela. Vesuvian, disclaimed Teresa. Lengthy in course. Indubitously generous and warm, chirped Jacob, with a trace of oak. I will not record any more of the words shared between them, since it begins to get a little tedious after a while. I managed to speak to Jacob, who said that their ritual practice stems from poetic sources. Our trump-smelling art takes inspiration from the great twentieth-century writer James Joyce. In his masterpiece called Ulysses, the main character called Leopold Bloom goes to the toilet. Quietly he read, restraining himself, the first column, and, yielding but resisting, began the second. Midway, his last resistance yielding, he allowed his bowels to ease themselves quietly as he read, reading still patiently, that slight constipation of yesterday quite gone. I hope it's not too big to bring on piles again. No, just right. He read on, seated calm above his own rising smell. Neat, certainly. I'm not sure where old Jacob was coming from, but his conviction was not to be doubted. Once they'd finished and most of them had dispersed, Itzel turned up. She was linking arms with a handsome young lover she had recently picked up. He was a friend of Abe's, who encouraged this tender encounter of the flesh between his lover and his friend. He gave Itzel a kiss on her lips, told her to enjoy herself while he went off to collect herbs for the meal that was being prepared. The meal was made with simple homegrown food and was delicious. During the meal, I sat next to Niall, which gave me a chance to hear him elaborate on his vision of our world. A vision that Faye thought so highly of. A vision I was dying to hear more about. It's difficult for me to summarise in detail, but I'll give it a go. Basically, he said that the upper strata are conspiring to impose lower stratum conditions on many of the middle stratum members, so as to reduce their privileges and keep more privileges for themselves. The Darvosians are planning to decimate lower stratum numbers by sending them to Ray Diplasis or by keeping us permanently strapped into the great social engine, which will reprogram us, turn us into zombies, and take away all of our humanity until we gradually die off. For Niall, society is basically a machine running on human energy sucked out of people like me. As you can imagine, I wasn't exactly ecstatic about hearing this news. I always thought I was contributing to society, not having the best of me sucked out for the benefit of a remote few. I wanted to know more about these mysterious creatures at the top of the social hierarchy. Niall says he has met some of them, and says that they are not the great geniuses that they are made out to be. Far from it, they are just the offspring of the rapacious elite, who in past eras managed by hook or by crook, by connections or through wealth, or some combination thereof, to be in the best position to take advantage of all the upcoming innovations, and increase their grip on power. They have made themselves indispensable to the short-run stability of society as a whole, and dissimulate their selfish control over all of us behind stories about everything functioning handsomely. On hearing this, I was scandalised. I had never expected anything of the sort. I didn't fully believe it, I just couldn't, and yet it sort of made sense. Why else would I have to spend so much of my time plugged in, if not to suck out my life force? It is a way of taming us, and taking away our initiative. As for the ad feeds, it amounts to no more than using our brain power so that others can benefit. I've always known that in a way, but in defence of ad flushes, I told Niall that it was also an exchange. 
We give them our brain time and they give us extra hours off work. He replied that it can only be called an exchange when equal parties are involved. That is hardly the case when one party can dig into the brain of the other and when one who is having his thoughts probed, prodded and shaped doesn't even know what the other party is using his brain for. I didn't have much by way of an answer to this. Niall says that most dissidents are from the middle stratum and many of them remember a time when they weren't often plugged in. Later, they were increasingly pressurised into becoming cogs in the great societal machine. They dreamt of being freed from having to provide bioenergy, a privilege now reserved within the strata system, to the upper stratum since the great energy shortage of a generation ago. He said that most of what's called the Hedonor Revolution was a farce and a swindle. The upper stratum is throwing sweetened crumbs at the pigeons to shut the people out of power, to shut them up and keep them calm. It's like the old madhouses when they used to dope patients up because they didn't know what to do with them. I wasn't quite sure about this because there is so much in the neuro games and neurotainment that I have always enjoyed. But I didn't want to contradict him because once he gets going, he can be a little intimidating. Besides, most of his listeners were nodding their heads and I didn't want to be the only one disagreeing with him. So I kept my reservations to myself. Not that I would have much of interest to say if I had opened my mouth. Anyways, hopefully I'll get to talk about this with Faye in a private context. Or maybe not Faye, because I don't want her to think I reject her world, because I don't. What Niall said has made me think seriously about the kind of neurotainment I choose, and has made me want to do some careful searching for informative neurometries. When he had finished talking to the seated crowd gathered before him, I asked him more personal stuff about how long he had been a dissident and how long he had known people in Faye's group. He smiled at the idea that Faye had a group at all, like she was some kind of tribal leader. He said that he had probably bumped into most of them many times on his travels, but some of them he'd only come across recently. Then he explained solemnly that dissidents do not function like strata folk. Here we are all sibs, everyone in the same boat. We got on with the other newly met dissidents easily and quickly because we know that we all belong to the same family of dissidents. At that point I slipped in a question to find out what I knew about Faye. He had known her for many years on and off. He sang her praises as a militant at some length. While he was doing so, I could not get the thought out of my mind that he had once been intimate with Faye and that he still had feelings for her. You see, many, though not all, dissidents pair up sexually with new partners on a whim, without much complication. They don't believe in possessiveness. If a couple wants to be exclusive, it's tolerated. But if sexual exclusivity lasts too long without a break, it's a little frowned upon. After listening to much wise talk about sexual and social mores, economic and societal organisation and the like, I finally managed to pluck up the courage to ask him, Were you ever lovers with Faye? There is a love all over the universe for all those able to draw from its miraculous net. Er, does that mean yes? You know that we are not selfish with our love. Love is something one loves to give, or it is not love. Wherever two or more desires cross, wherever a passion flares up, there love shall blaze. But does that mean... Do you mind speaking to me for a minute as though I was a total simpleton? It shouldn't be too hard a stretch of the imagination. Has she had other lovers among this group of dissidents? Faye is of a particularly tender nature, and is, the gods be praised, generous with her love. Her love of all kinds. She is much appreciated for it far and wide. We do not keep tallies. The beauty of our exile from the barbarous machine they call civilization lies in that sometimes the river of desire is heavy with life, at other times it trickles, and that is fine, so long as we all understand that there can be no claim to property, all is well. He kept on talking in this manner, but I stopped listening. I was dumbfounded. I had no right to be, but I was all the same. It's true that I'd seen with my own eyes how dissidents were adventurous with their promiscuity. It made sense to me because they don't have sex dolls or neuroporn. 
but somehow I failed to include Faye in my image of all that. I felt like a right nitwit. I was obviously being possessive in a way that dissidents are not. They may have broken out of that kind of thinking, but I was still steeped in my regressive mental morass. I wanted Faye all to myself. I still want her to myself. I don't know if I could bear it if I saw her in the arms of someone else. I don't know if I can bear life without her.